I've wanted to be a nurse since I think I was about four years old. Um, my dad actually had a pretty serious back injury when I was young, and uh, so he spent a lot of time in the ICU, and I remember the nurses there uh, made me feel so comfortable, and I realized, hey, I want to be the person to make others feel comfortable. Uh, coming from an immigrant family, I was really interested in really changing how we talk about mental health and also um, talking about the opportunities that I have to uh, destigmatize mental health in my community, so that was really important to me. As a nurse, I get this incredible privilege. It's completely transformed me. I've grown in confidence, I've grown in self-awareness, I've grown um, to understand what my purpose is and the population in which I want to practice. Nursing allows us to have a unique and um, intimate look into people's lives. I don't just want to be a provider, I want to lead people. And I believe at Yale, I get the opportunities to learn how to be the right type of leader I want to become. And I want to do it on a national level, whatever I'm doing in 10 years. It could be for the CDC, it could be for the White House. You're going to see my name and they're going to know I went to Yale. I think of nursing as the family profession. My mother was a nurse, but you know, my grandfather was a nurse. After his little store on the Lower East Side of New York was wiped out in the Depression, he then uh, developed a profession of caring for elderly and ill individuals. My wife's a nurse. I have a very strong sense of what it means to be a nurse. Uh, it, is a, it is an altruistic work of serving people in moments when they are most need of help. And so when I think of the nursing school, I think of the service that they render to, to all parts of our community. During COVID, every one of the people that gave me a vaccine uh, was somebody who was a student at the Yale Nursing School. We support the nurses and the nurses support us. And that service makes a huge difference to the communities in which we live. So Yale's primary purpose is to improve the world today and for future generations. That is a mission of every nurse who graduates from Yale. They do it by leading organizations. They do it through advanced practice. They do it through clinical service. They do it through nursing education. They do it through science. But they are all focused on improving the world. That's what Yale is all about. That's what the Yale School of Nursing is all about. You come to nursing because you have this incredible need to be part of humanity and to bring health to all kinds of different people. Be a nurse, be a nurse practitioner, be a mom, and also inspire the next generation of nurses. I mean, that's huge. We bring dedication and passion for the work alongside of this desire to, to, to bring change to the system at large and to open ourselves to approaching healthcare from different perspectives. What I see is just such an exciting view of the future of what they want to do, right, and how much they want to take on and how much they want to improve health for all. This is the call of nursing. The ability to impact change the ability to conduct research that is important not only to myself, but also to the health and well-being of others. We need to be thinking about not just illness, but wellness. And not just wellness, but what does it mean for a person in the context of their life? What we're looking for in the next century is who we are continuing to become. And that is what makes this place ever exciting. I am just passionate about educating the next generation of, of nurses. We have varieties of opportunities to make some transformational impact all the way across the world. Why is that in one word? Pioneering. Impactful. Trailblazing. Exciting. Empowering. Inspirational. It's leadership. The people. Unique. Community. Integrity. Resilient. Opportunities. Innovation. It's where tradition and innovation cross each other and come together to contribute to the betterment of our society.
afternoon and welcome to the official kickoff of the Yale School of Nursing Centennial Celebration. I am Melissa Gallinato, a member of the Centennial Planning Committee and a second year pediatric nurse practitioner primary care student. It is an honor to be the first to welcome you to this exciting moment in the school's history and to introduce President Salovey. On behalf of my nursing and midwifery classmates, I'd like to say what a remarkable achievement it is to be here. Given the diversity of our backgrounds and unique experiences, I look forward to witnessing how we collectively contribute to the advancement of YSN's mission of better health for all people. When I, along with the rest of class of 2024, 20, graduate in the spring, we will follow nearly 6,000 alumni into all aspects of healthcare. MSN graduates will become clinicians in every imaginable care setting. Our doctor of nursing practice degree recipients will lead health systems and influence healthcare policy. Those of us who earn a PhD will continue to teach the next generation of providers through interprofessional education, research, and practice. It is clear why SN alumni have and will continue to innovate, lead, and transform healthcare in ways not imaginable for nurses 100 years ago. And now it is my privilege to introduce the 23rd president of Yale, Peter Salovey. President Salovey has both celebrated and championed YSN's mission and our values in nursing and midwifery. In the summer, he attended the disaster simulation for our first year Geppen students and eagerly delved into conversations to learn about the students' intense experiences. President Salovey firmly believes in the impact of our chosen paths, so much so that he and his loved ones endowed a Salovey Family Nursing Scholarship here at Yale, or at Yale School of Nursing. It is a privilege to have such a dedicated advocate for YSN in the top position at this university, and we welcome his presence here today as a testament to YSN's integral role in shaping Yale's future. I invite you to read the rest of his formal biography in our program and allow him to share more about his commitment to supporting YSN. I would now like to welcome to the podium, President Salovey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I very much appreciate it. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's so nice to see you all and all supporting the school in its 100th year. It's an enormous pleasure to be part of the great history of the Yale School of Nursing. And uh, I very much uh, uh, have been looking forward uh, to this centennial uh, moment. Uh, I'm also delighted that with us today are uh, Yale School of Nursing faculty, Yale School of Nursing staff members, students, alumni who are now practitioners, uh, uh, other educators, other uh, researchers. Uh, I'm delighted you're all with us today, and I'm especially delighted that our new dean has arrived, uh, Azita Amami. And so uh, uh, we'll let me give her a... Anne, it's so great to see you as well, and that uh, perfect time for a handoff is at the 100-year mark, right? Uh, 98, not enough, 102, maybe too many. 100 is perfect, 100 is perfect. Uh, I'm also delighted uh, uh, that uh, Rajiv Shah is with us from the Rockefeller Foundation. He'll make some remarks in a few moments, but uh, it's very meaningful uh, for us to have him here uh, with us because the, because the Rockefeller Foundation was here right from the beginning. He'll tell you a little bit more about that history, but it was gifts from the Rockefeller Foundation that essentially allowed Yale to create uh, this school. Well, 1923, 100 years ago, what was happening? Uh, the foundation, Rockefeller Foundation's Goldmark Report suggested that a transformation in nursing education was needed. The word they used to describe nursing education up to that time was inadequate. Not, that's the word they used. The report <laughs> wasn't inadequate. And in partnership with the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, early nursing leaders like Dean Annie Goodrich uh, set out to make this the solution, make Yale the solution to those inadequacies in nursing uh, education. So we became the first school to offer a full educational experience for nurses in training rather than uh, an apprenticeship program. Uh, the curriculum that Dean Goodridge and others uh, pulled together 
talked about future nurses, and this is amazing that this is 100 years ago, this language. Future nurses as scientifically informed, technically expert, and socially experienced. Right? Mm -hmm. it, still, it still sounds like exactly what we do uh, today in the School of Nursing. And in fact, there's a whole history of nursing leadership that uh, uh, came from this school. I won't uh, go over it with you. I'll just mention one, uh, Dean Florence Wald, who brought the hospice movement from uh, England to the United States. I mention it because Brantford Hospice celebrates its 50th uh, anniversary uh, this same year that we uh, celebrate uh, our 100th. Um, Yale was, uh, when Yale opened uh, admission for students with a bachelor's degree but no prior background in nursing through uh, what is now called GAPIN, the Graduate Entry Pre-Specialty Program, uh, uh, that was uh, a first. By 1975, Yale School of Nursing has 10 specialty programs and tracks, was at the vanguard of the nurse practitioner and nurse midwifery educational uh, movement at the graduate uh, level. Fast forward, 100 years forward, and nursing is making, the School of Nursing is making all kinds of contributions across the university. Let me pick just one. Uh, as many of you know, we have a planetary uh, uh, solutions initiative, the planetary health initiative within Planetary Solutions uh, is uh, uh, a um, touch point for the School of Nursing. Uh, how to uh, essentially deal with the way in which climate change is affecting uh, uh, human uh, health. When I think about the next century of the Yale School of Nur Nursing, I'm optimistic. I think nursing's centrality to this university and nursing as a profession centrality to improving the world now and for the future is just all too obvious. So in the film you heard about my family. I sometimes say nursing was the family business in, 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 in our family. Uh, my former brother-in-law was a nurse. You heard about that. Uh, my grandfather's story is interesting. Uh, after he was wiped out in the Depression, when my grandfather used to talk about being wiped out, he had a little store that was maybe about 500 square feet, and it went bankrupt in the Depression, but, but he didn't have anything to begin with, really. So <laughs> that was on the Lower East Side of New York, and, and, and as you heard, to make a living, he just cared for people, and he had no formal education. But in those days, um, on the testimony of your clients, you could get a license as an LPN. And, uh, and I always used to joke, I actually, I have it. But I used to say my, my grandfather was uh, New York State LPN number two or something like that. <laughs> he had to have been one of the first men uh, uh, to be licensed as an LPN. Uh, but he was, and he, was, he talked about his patients, and he talked about what he had learned kind of in the trenches uh, of nursing uh, all my childhood. And so uh, my mother, who married into that family, uh, and he always had a special relationship because my mother, uh, as you heard, was a nurse. She went to uh, uh, what, was, what, what is formally called Jewish Hospital and Medical Center of Brooklyn, but everybody calls it Brooklyn Jewish, doesn't exist anymore, and uh, had that old style of RN uh, education that wasn't university-based and was more apprentice-oriented. Uh, but my childhood, I was a latchkey child because uh, we came home from school, my brother and I, and we uh, uh, made ourselves a, a snack, uh, and we waited for our mom to come home from the hospital uh, uh, where she was working, or the practice where she was working. Ultimately, she moved into geriatric nursing toward uh, the last maybe 20 years of her profession and was uh, the director of nurses at uh, geriatric hospitals first in, uh, well, by that time we'd left New Jersey. We were now in Buffalo, New York, and later in Los Angeles. Um, the stories that my grandfather told, that my uh, brother-in-law told, that my mother told, made an impression on all of us in my family. And... Uh, 
helped us, I think, appreciate how rewarding the profession can be. And I know our students feel that way, but also how complex it is. And I would say in more recent years, uh, how in need of improvement our healthcare system uh, uh, is. Well, it was the public health crisis ushered in by COVID that I think helped every one of us who is not a nurse or a public health professional like my wife is, or a physician, helped all of us who are not uh, in, in the health professions truly appreciate, truly appreciate how hard this work is, how needed this work is, and how in short supply this work is. We're still recovering. I mean, we're not out of the pandemic. And, and uh, further, we're still recovering from the effect that the pandemic had on our workforce in the health professions. And so 100th anniversary comes, you don't plan it for a particular time, it comes in the 100th year. But the university's response to the 100th anniversary, the fact that we are matching gifts to the school, the idea that we are celebrating the centrality of the school, I think is not an accident in coming in these years as we uh, recover as a society from this global pandemic. Well, everyone who is here today has been involved in helping position in some way the Yale School of Nursing at the center of Yale University and help reposition the profession as at the center of healthcare as delivered in this country and throughout the world. And I thank you for all of that hard work. And I thank you for letting me uh, be a part of both today's celebration, but this larger mission and these larger goals as well. So thank you all very much for being here today. And congratulations to the school. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is the Yale School of Nursing's new dean, Dr. Azita Amami. So Azita is an internationally recognized nursing leader, a nursing investigator. Uh, she's had a career dedicated to fostering wellness. She's had two more than two decades in leading uh, um, uh, research and teaching in university settings. This is not, what's the expression? This is not your first rodeo. This is not your first rodeo. This is her third deanship. And we are so fortunate uh, that she can build on Anne's accomplishments and lead us into the next uh, century of nursing at Yale. And that she uh, responded when I called her and asked her, would you like a third deanship? And she ultimately <laughs> said yes. Her work has focused quite a bit on the social determinants that affect health and wellness. As a part-time health psychologist, that appeals to me greatly. She's a trustee of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. She's been an advocate for health equity and accessibility, for quality health care for all people, uh, and in fact, quality health care beyond the nursing profession. I know she is the right leader for the school's Second century, so please join me in welcoming her to the podium. Thank you very much, President Salovey, for those very kind words. And good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be oh, thank with you, you today. So warm. Thank you. So warm. Uh, I would like to begin uh, by uh, a land acknowledgement. Uh, to uh, initiate our uh, conversation. Uh, Yale School of Nursing is situated on the land of the past and present Quinnipiac people. It is with deep gratitude that we honor the land, people, history, and traditions of the indigenous peoples who stewarded uh, the land for generations 
and who are still connected to the land as well as the responsibility that comes with sharing the land. We acknowledge the painful history and with our mission at Yale School of Nursing of better health for all people, we embrace the commitment to health, justice, and care for all communities, especially those who suffer unacceptable health disparities. So a, a centennial celebration honors the past, but it also uh, uh, is an appropriate occasion to envision the future that will be built on that past. I want to take a few moments uh, today to share with you um, the future I see for this School of Nursing and how the past makes that future possible. I see a future where nursing leads the way on promoting wellness rather than focusing and addressing illnesses. I see a future where better health for all people becomes a reality. My vision um, of the future sees the healthcare system in which everyone feels comfortable, respected, welcome, and understood because we have educated nurses to create that environment. My vision of the future sees vastly improved access to healthcare because nurses are practicing to the full scope of their capabilities, including delivery, delivering um, urgently needed primary care to historically underserved populations. And perhaps most importantly, I see a future in which our advocacy results in addressing the many social determinants of health that are the root cause of disparities of outco in outcomes and a lack of wellness for many people. These disparities are not new, nor will they be easily um, eliminated. These are deeply entrenched realities reflecting the structural and systemic inequities resulting from racism, classism, and inequitable access to the, of, to the resources people need to live and thrive. At Yale School of Nursing, we are the heirs um, to a legacy of innovation, creativity, advo and advocacy. Yale School of Nursing was founded as a break from the past, as President Salovey uh, shared with you. For the first time, nursing was an academic discipline with its own body of knowledge to be taught and mastered. Nurses were no longer just a source of cheap labor uh, for the medical wards. They were now educated to provide care that enable people to get better. This was, believe me or not, a groundbreaking concept. Our first dean, Annie Goodrich, was the first female dean at Yale. We were among the first nursing schools to grant a master's degree and to require prior nursing experience to admission. In the 1970s, we introduced the idea of graduate entry pre-specialty nursing GAPAN program. And at that point of time, just thinking about making a non-nurse, uh, an advanced nurse uh, practitioner in three years, it was something that no one would believe in to be accomplished, but we did it. Our legacy of leadership continues today, mostly recently with the launch of uh, the brand new uh, online MSN program. Yale School of Nursing began breaking barriers at its inception and has never stopped doing so. We will continue adding to that, uh, ad to that admirable legacy as we enter our new century. I believe there is a widespread consensus that the American healthcare, healthcare system is not delivering um, optimal results. 
there is less consensus about how to make it better. Well, the short answer is nurses. As one of the leading schools of nursing, we have a, an opportunity and an obligation to educate the nurses who will lead in creating change and delivering better health for all people. Yale School of Nursing was a paradigm shift at its inception. And we will be, the, mm, that, we will be that once again in our second century. Our nurse graduates will continue being compassionate, capable clinicians. They will also be powerful, persuasive advocates, inqu inquisitive, accomplished researchers, inspirational educators, capable and creative policymakers, respected and respectful community members, and above all else, leaders in re re redefining what wellness is and how it can be made the standard of care. Today's theme is imagining the next century for, of better health for all people. I want to do more than just imagining it. I want um, to make it happen by leading a school of nursing that shares a vision uh, of a future of wellness, equitable access to healthcare, and a system of care that lives up to promises of equity made at this country's foundation. Make no mistake, getting to that goal is, challenge, is a very challenging task. But uh, for a century, Yale School of Nursing has identified and met challenges in healthcare. It's who we are and it's what we do. We can thank our predecessors for the legacy and we can best honor them by um, committing to following the, uh, in their footsteps, foot, footsteps and looking forward, not away. We cannot accept as insurmountable the divisions and equities of lack of wellness that are today's reality in our country. We cannot accept that healthcare disparities are inevitable. And we absolutely cannot accept that the idea, um, the idea that meeting, the, um, uh, meeting and eliminating these uh, challenges is too costly or too difficult. Nursing is America's most trusted profession. Tens of millions of people are counting on us to create a new healthcare system uh, in this country to focus on improving the health of all people. We are the voice and the advocates for those who have no voices. We are Yale School of Nursing. We will be the clinicians and advocates and voices that inspire a transformation in Americans' health. health. So thank you very much and welcome to the next century of Yale School of Nursing. <laughs> it's now my real pleasure to introduce our special guest. Dr. Rajiv Shah is president of the Rockefeller uh, Foundation, which made the grant, as you heard uh, previously, that established Yale School of Nursing centuries ago. The Rockefeller Foundation believed in advanced nurse uh, practice for nurses when the concept doesn't, didn't even exist. No one knew about it. So a very pioneering, very, very innovative. And the foundation continues to identify and support transformative changes um, across human and planetary health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Uh, just out of curiosity, how many students are here? Oh, good. Well, thank you uh, for being here in particular and for taking on the mission you're taking on. Thank you, President Salve, for that outstanding set of remarks and for sharing with us why you care so much and have in your family for generations. 
Uh, and thank you, Dean Amami, for uh, inaugurating the new century for this great school and for your extraordinary leadership that I know will help this school reach even higher heights. So it's really exciting to be here, and it's great to be with this community uh, and to honor a little bit of our shared history. Uh, in many ways, the Rockefeller Foundation and the Yale School of Nursing were founded for the same reason, uh, effectively to use science and the frontiers of science to improve the health of everyone. And in fact, before the foundation was even incorporated uh, in 1913, John D. Rockefeller Sr. gave uh, more than a million dollars to try to eradicate hookworm, a treatable disease that affected, remember this number, more than 40% of people living in the American South. The result of that work, which uh, created an infrastructure at the time called the General Education Board, uh, resulted in creating America's county-based public health infrastructure. That work also provided the basic protocol for the Rockefeller Foundation's global public health campaigns, which began thereafter and targeted a number of important infectious diseases. The goal of those campaigns were all about making health and the access to health more equitable, in particular for vulnerable communities. Back then, uh, the definition of vulnerable community was very large because the application of science in medicine, in nursing, and in public health was haphazard and unorganized. And while I am not the author, as you can tell, of the original report the president made reference to, I think the indictment of medicine and health sciences uh, at the turn of the last century was that it was not a science-based discipline and the foundation worked with institutions across the world to create a science-based discipline. Within all of the extraordinary inequities that existed in health in the United States and around the world at that time, nurses were a bright spot. We've heard about Annie Goodrich and the extraordinary history she's had, uh, but I am new to her story, and so it was, it was fun for me to learn that she became a nurse before the turn of the century. And as nursing superintendent when the First World War broke out, she warned that the US Army was deeply unprepared and it would lead to significant competitive disadvantage. As a result, she was chosen to organize and lead the Army School of Nursing as its first ever dean, for which she received the Distinguished Service Medal, probably the first uh, nurse to receive that medal. After her service to the Army, she, of course, came here and founded this amazing school. The Yale School of Nursing, under her leadership, was founded with a $150,000 five-year grant from the Rockefeller Foundation. <laughs> I asked President Salafi if he could start a school today for $150,000. He said no. Uh, and we did a little math, and we learned that we think that's about 2.7 or $2.8 million in today's money. And just a few years later, at the end of that grant, when the uh, foundation reviewed the progress of the mission, which was bringing science and educational discipline and lifting up the baseline education process for nurses and nursing, they decided it was so successful, they awarded another $1 million endowment which really allowed the school to flourish. We think that's about $18 million in today's money. I also asked the president if you could start a school today for 18 million, he said no. Uh, so Yale and the foundation learned together that nursing was in fact the key to public health in the United States in that window of time. To me, that's a lesson that I think is extraordinarily relevant today. Uh, for I know how many of you uh, as students here have put your efforts and energies into global health, which is where the foundation spends a lot, a lot of its resources today. And we've seen over the last 15 or 20 years extraordinary progress. Just to give you one example, about the turn of the century, around 2000, there were about 9 to 10 million children under the age of 5 who died every year, mostly of easily preventable causes, and almost entirely in developing nations. That number was effectively cut in half until about a few years ago, and has been steadily creeping up each of the last few years. 
And the truth is this week is, uh, we call it Climate Week or the Sustainable Development Goals Week in New York at the United Nations. And it's been pretty grim to look at the numbers because over the last few years, we're systematically unwinding years, even decades of progress in fighting hunger, fighting poverty, and certainly in our common mission of standing up for health equity and international public health. And so now more than ever, we have to recognize that nurses are once again, have always been a bright spot in the fight. From those of you who helped vaccinate migrant, transgender, and other vulnerable people against COVID-19 in India, to those who are tracking maternal and newborn health using new digital tools in Uganda, to those who administered PCR tests to Afghan refugees right here in New Haven. Your point of service, point of leadership, and points of science are the hopes we have for changing the status of health and public health at home and around the world. That insight, which was true many, many years ago, is still true today. And so it's a real honor to get to be with you and celebrate your history. And it's even more exciting to get to be here and participate in a conversation where we'll talk about your future. Because I believe now more than ever with the pace of technology, the pace of science, new tools related to artificial intelligence, and new realities about a society slowly but steadily opening up to include everybody. What this school has stood for, its values, its commitments, its science, and its people will be more transformational in this century to come. Thank you. I think that our microphones are on. Do you hear us well? OK, great. So I would like to begin to th uh, by thanking both of you for your very powerful, inspirational remarks. Thank and thank you very much for uh, being with us today to discuss very important topic that uh, I think that uh, many of us are very interested to learn more about. Uh, so before we uh, uh, start our conversation, I just would like to uh, share with you that after our conversation, there will be opportunities for the audience to ask questions. Uh, so while we uh, are carrying out our conversation, please start thinking about what are the topics that you would like to uh, ask our, our special guests here today. Yeah, I would like to begin with my first questions to both of you. 100 years ago, the Rockefeller Foundation founded the Yale School of Nursing at the first academic, uh, as the first academic nursing school in this country. Uh, we are honored uh, to be here 100 years later talking about the importance of how this, wor uh, this workforce has evolved and, and progressed. Um, so for each of you, what is the most surprising change you have witnessed uh, or heard about in the profession of nursing? Who would like to start? I, I'm, ha I'm happy to start. I, you know, I, I get to see, I ran a federal agency called USAID for President Obama, US Agency for International Development. And so I've had a chance to see nursing and, nurse, uh, and the practice of nursing in societies around the world. And the thing I find is that the secret transformation that's happening is if you go to uh, a village in northern India or uh, a slum outside of Nairobi where uh, some of us just were a few weeks ago called Kabira, you will meet nurses who are taking their smartphones and an extraordinary amount of technology with them to the interface with patients. And it is transforming their capacity to address malnutrition, to identify disease, to rapidly uh, determine how to triage communities, and making them, frankly, ever more powerful and ever more successful. There's an outstanding long piece today, in, or yesterday maybe, in the New York Times about the community health workers, which of course are not anywhere near the high level of uh, Yale-educated School of Nursing graduates. But I think there's going to be a trend over time 
with the democratization of knowledge, information, and technology at the point of service and the point of care so that over time we'll finally be able to reach absolutely everyone with the ethic and spirit of nursing with which this school was founded, which is the country at the time needed 50,000 nurses, had 11,000, and was asking itself, how could you quickly uh, generate 40,000 additional super skilled, highly trained professionals? I think that's the kind of thinking we need uh, today in countries around the world if we're to turn around the reality that we're losing ground on fighting malaria deaths or dealing with under five mortality or have an increase in neonatal uh, mortality in, in many settings. Uh, and even just dealing with the extraordinary disparities in this country that, um, Dean, you mentioned in your opening uh, part of your remarks. So that's the thing I'm both most excited about and most surprised by is how pervasive uh, that access to technology is going to be when it really hits. Thank you. So uh, let me answer that question in a little different way. And uh, I don't know if surprise is the emotion, but certainly surprised and thrilled uh, uh, is, is the emotion that I feel when I think about this. So when I was an undergraduate, I took a class called medical sociology. And one of the interesting aspects of medical sociology as taught in the 1970s was a set of experiments, field experiments, done mostly in the 50s and early 60s on status and the health professionals, health professions. And they typically set up a situation in which a, a nurse would discover in a hospital setting that a physician had ordered the wrong dose of a medication or had uh, you know, set out or delivered the wrong, wrong dose. And in various ways, there was a whole set of experiments. In various ways, the question was, would the nurse confront the physician and say, you've got the wrong drug here, you've got the wrong amount of this drug here. And in the 1950s, again and again, what was demonstrated is the nurses all knew there was a mistake. And many of them didn't say anything. And this was taught in the, in, the, in, health, in the sociology of health as an example of status and status characteristics. Some of it was gendered, some of it was professional status, and how it could lead, this status consciousness could lead to uh, mistakes in, in healthcare. What's wonderful, and surprising isn't the right word, but thrilling is you couldn't replicate those studies today. You couldn't get that result today. The way in which nurses are incorporated as equal members of a team, respected as a profession, and are expected to say, sorry, doc, you don't have that, right? Uh, I saw it myself when I was a psychology intern at the West Haven VA hospital just a couple of decades later. And um, uh, I, I'm... That says a lot about the profession. It says a lot about education. It says a lot about the kinds of people attracted to nursing. It says a lot about um, gender equality. Uh, and uh, uh, I think it's a, uh, of course, uh, it results in the delivery of safer and better health care for everyone. Great answers. Thank you. Uh, the next question is to all of us, actually, and I would like to answer it first. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> Following your, <laughs> your delight and surprise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, what is the one baseline improvement you see as critical mm. to better health in the United States and then internationally? And I have been thinking about it for, for a long time, and I, I would like to say that the most critical baseline, based on my opinion, is um, a universal healthcare access to everyone um, through affordable um, care, and with a very sharp focus on prevention, health promotion, uh, that will be done through very strong primary care, and of course, delivered by nurses. So what about... Yeah, you know, I would, I would answer in a very similar way. There is no doubt 
uh, that the economics of healthcare would be improved dramatically if we put more emphasis on prevention. Uh, and uh, you know, as a, as a psychologist, I know that. As a nurse professional, many of you know that. Uh, the uh, the most expensive things to thing to do is to fix problems after they happen rather than prevent them. And so the emphasis on behavior and lifestyle factors, and environmental factors, and the prevention of illness before it happens um, is partly what's going to, I think, save our, uh, our, our health care uh, system in this country. Um, so I, you know, I, I think we have to really uh, reorient mm. uh, around a, a prevention model rather than a, 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 a model focused on, on repair. Yeah, I'll agree with that, but use maybe different words. I, I think uh, I think wellness is the and and the science of wellness and achieving wellness will ultimately be the path to help address large scale improvements in population health, particularly in the United States. Eileen O'Connor is is with me. She's a a former Yale uh, administrator and leader here. So. Yeah. Uh, she, we were excited to come here together, but during COVID, we, we worked and through Eileen helped uh, worked with the Yale School of Nursing and with Yale University on testing access in our country. And you won't, you, you might not remember this, but in in March and April of 2020, you know, uh, actually testing was not commonly available. Uh, mm -hmm. The United States had rejected through the CDC a South Korean testing format and our own format. Uh, was faulty, and the government uh, at the highest level of our federal government was actually against testing, right? <laughs> and so, you know, that, that's a good example of just, if you, if you sat and asked yourself, how would you get hundreds of millions of tests manufactured, give people the confidence to use them just to track their own uh, health and wellness? Uh, that's the kind of question that I think we're going to be dealing with over and over. Today at the foundation, when we look to the future, really coming out of the COVID experience, where America had the highest excess mortality of any nation on the planet in COVID, which is absurd in a country that puts, as the president made brief uh, reference to, more than $4 trillion a year in our, in our healthcare economy, uh, we think sustained wellness the reduction of large-scale chronic disease that made Americans so vulnerable to mortality is going to be the only viable answer. And it'll be you in this room that develop the, the science, but also the, the way, uh, the pathway so that people can listen, hear, engage, and participate in keeping themselves healthy so they're not as vulnerable um, as we've been in the past. Thank you. Dr. Shaw. Noting that the foundation has invested heavily in solutions related to climate change under your leadership, uh, what do you see as the connection between climate and human health? And could you give us some success stories um, that you feel the foundation or your partners or other organizations have had related to climate and health? Well, well, first, uh, I, I heard the uh, president, your, your uh, reference to planetary health. And I'm really glad to hear that the School of Nursing is actively engaged in you know, understanding the correlation between planetary health boundaries and human health boundaries. I think if you look at climate change, it's going to have a few major dislocations for large-scale population health. The first is we just came out of a once-in-a-century pandemic. You can expect those much more frequently because the pressures uh, that expose populations to pandemic threats like zoonotic pressure will be much, much higher as the climate changes. Uh, a second is we know we're going to have much more infectious disease in many more places than we do today. That's already very obvious. So the 50-year history we've had of a relative decline in infectious disease, mortality, morbidity is going to have sustained upward pressure now because of climate over the next, next bit of time. A third is heat. And heat, I mean, I was with uh, these women that are salt flat workers in, in the desert in northern Gujarat in, in India, um, and they're working in 40 degrees uh, centigrade heat, and it is, it's deadly to do that. They're already uh, 
poorly nourished and they're already the most vulnerable. And so the combination of heat and vulnerability will, will yield extraordinary consequences. And the final one that I don't think most people realize is there's a, going to be a 30% reduction in agricultural productivity caused by a changing climate. And you know, if you look at just the path for hunger and the underlying hidden hunger or malnutrition and micronutrient malnutrition that you all are experts on and most people don't know about, uh, it, it's going to make people much more vulnerable to all of this in the future. So I think there are some big threats. The good news is you're on top of it. We'll count on your science and your insights and your ability to get people to behave differently to keep themselves protected. But, but that's why I really believe your work is more needed for the next century than the past one. Uh, I, I don't think I can add to that answer. That was a, just a fabulous answer. Other than to say... It is very fortunate that Yale has a school of nursing, a school of public health, a school of medicine, a school of the environment, departments in arts and sciences and in engineering and applied sciences concerned with uh, the environment, concerned with uh, um, climate change, uh, and beyond all of that, because it is going to take a multidisciplinary approach to solve these problems. Yes, we all have our particular emphases uh, and expertise, but uh, it's going to be working across boundaries, whether those boundaries are international or <laughs> disciplinary uh, to, to, to address these problems. Sometimes I think, uh, as a longtime um, academic, that the international boundaries may be easier to transcend than the disciplinary ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> Uh, that would be too bad, and uh, I think we're trying to model uh, a more unified approach here at Yale to addressing, uh, I think, the most profound um, uh, problem of our lifetime. So I would like to follow on what you just uh, shared, and because uh, I know that during your ten tenure, Yale has invested campus-wide in, in um, climate issues through the Planetary Solution Project. Um, and could you more specifically comment what role nursing could, because I, I know the, the, the interdisciplinary you know, collaboration and the challenge that, that you just uh, alluded to. So, uh, and we have a very um, you know, strong platform in the School of Nursing for Planetary Health. I would like to hear your thoughts about how nursing could play a, an important role yeah, I think I, yeah, I think there's many roles that nursing can play in, in, um, in uh, addressing uh, climate solutions, uh, planetary solutions. Uh, let me just give a couple. Um, first of all, uh, there is such a strong emphasis in this nursing school and at Yale on, on global health. You are already all over the world. You are already collaborating with investigators and clinicians and educators uh, all over the world. And you do that in ways that transcend some of the political barriers. Uh, so for example, Yale School of Nursing has worked in China for a long time. Politically, um, we are at a, a tense moment between the two countries. In, in reality, Climate change is not addressed without China and the U.S. working together. It just can't. It, these two enormous economies uh, uh, have to collaborate. That's really hard to do right now at a political level. But nurses in China and nurses at, at Yale can work together on projects. And, you know, when I'm, in, when I'm in Washington, I visit Capitol Hill, and I talk to senators and members of the House usually who have a Yale degree, but they're on both sides of the aisle, <laughs> right? And I say, I bring up China. I'm just using China as an example. I bring up China. Most of, it, most of the time, you get the current view, right, which is quite negative, and you get it from both sides of the aisle. And then I say, do you know we have dual degree programs in China? We have nurses working in China, collaborating on, on uh, capacity building projects and educational projects. Uh, we have a center in Beijing uh, for the university as a whole, run by the School of Management, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have joint degree programs. I, I say, uh, 
Do you think we should uh, pull out of all of that? Every one of them on both sides says, no, 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 stay involved. Please stay involved. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because at some level, um, they recognize that we have to look toward the future. We have huge global problems to solve, and we're not going to solve them in isolation. So the nur nurses are already doing that. Yale School of Nursing is already, uh, already doing it. And I guess the other, I'll just mention one other way. You're seeing uh, signs and symptoms and patient behavior often before we know what, we're, what it is that we're observing. Right? The way in which nurses are trained to observe and to observe whole humans and to observe behavior uh, and to observe the kinds of uh, measurable signs and symptoms that, that we use in healthcare uh, means that uh, uh, th those powers of observation, that training when put to use, is going to sound alarms often before we know what's, what's happening. We know what it is. Uh, and that, that's kind of a, what would you call it, sentinel function, maybe? Yeah. A sentinel Early function? One. Uh, so bring up sentinel functions on our centennial. <laughs> <laughs> Try to keep that straight. And, um, uh, you, you know, but it's a role. It's a role that primary care providers are always going to play. You will see it uh, even before, as a society, we know what it is. And that's going to be very, very important uh, as we confront new diseases or old diseases appearing in new places uh, as the climate changes. Thank you. Uh, so as both of you very eloquently um, uh, remarked on in, in your speeches about how the COVID-19 global pandemic uh, showed the world the heroic uh, you know, impact of, of nurses and what nurses do, um, it was really wonderful for, for all uh, us nurses to have that recognition, but now we are facing a backlash in, in not only uh, United States, but globally, there is a huge shortage of nurses. And I think that part of it is, is due to burnout because you know, in a couple of years, the work really, uh, the nursing work was really devastating. And, and, and so uh, what do you think we could do to address now the, the nursing shortage crisis? Uh, what are the, the ideas that you might have for? Uh... Well, uh, let me mention two, okay. just two. <clears throat> Nurses who are educated uh, as as leaders, as pro, uh, uh, you know, for the nursing profession, like here at Yale, uh, have uh, typically gone to college and and then have gone to graduate school, and they amass a lot of debt. At Yale, we've been uh, very much trying over the last decade to increase access to an education. And at this university, the, highest, the students with the highest debt on graduation, it, it's not all from Yale, that's for sure, but the students with the highest debt on graduation are our nursing students. Wow. That has to end. That has to end if we want to see more people go uh, into the profession. I don't come from a wealthy family, as you probably figured out from the video and from my comments about my family, but it is why we did a scholarship here in the School of Nursing uh, as, as the first um, endowment, uh, I hope the first among others that, uh, that, that, that we can do. And it was really my parents who, I, when, when I was uh, inaugurated as president, my mother called and she said, uh, we want to give you a gift for becoming president of Yale. What do you need? Uh, need a new camera? <laughs> uh, they got me a camera when I graduated from college. And I said, I don't need anything. And they said, well, we want to get you a gift. I said, well, figure out something you could do for Yale and do it for Yale at the level that you can do it. My dad was a chemistry professor. My mother was a nurse, as you heard. I said, figure out a level that you can do it. And they came up with the idea, we're going to do a scholarship at Yale, 
And we're going to do it in the nursing school because we know nurses have a lot of debt and because mom's a nurse. <clears throat> and that's what they did. And then we've tried to add more to it and friends have added more to it and, uh, uh, and the like. But I think if that, we don't have to tell. <laughs> I don't tell that story for your applause. I tell that story because it's a story that if we could tell more broadly, others would follow, others would do. Not, not, they would do their own version of this. They just don't know. They don't know how high the debt uh, uh, is. I said I was going to talk about two things we need to do, but I talked long enough, so let me yield to uh, Raji. Uh, I, I don't have anything to add beyond that, except that there should be, you know, I've always wondered why and I think this is a higher education uh, question, when there's so much sustained demand for something that's so critical to society here and around the world, uh, why can't there be more supply? So, you know, I, I don't know whether that means bigger schools of nursing or more schools of nursing. Certainly, in global health and on a global basis, we desperately need many, many, many more institutions that bring what Yale brings to, to nursing here uh, all over the planet. And, and you know, any estimate that you look at in terms of where people will, uh, where the needs will be for society over time, there's a much greater share of human labor that will go into the caring economy for those that look at it that way in the future than, than in the past and in a professionalized, compensated manner as opposed to in the informal economy. So. I just think there's a supply-demand mismatch, and I don't have enough expertise to know why there aren't so many more schools of nursing. Unfortunately, the Rockefeller Foundation, if we could start schools for $150,000, we would do it <laughs> today. we do it all over the planet, I promise. Uh, but, but we can't. And I'll say one, one more thing. The, 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 uh, when, when, we, when it was February, and certainly March, April, May 2020, what, what happened? This, this uh, virus that we, we didn't know much about, starting to move across the planet, arrives in the US. I remember when the first community transmitted case in Connecticut arrived, when we, our students went home for spring break and we told them, stay there. Mm -hmm. um, nurses went to work. Mm -hmm. Nurses just went to work and they, they you know, we were trying to keep everybody else out of the hospital. Nurses went into the hospital and into the clinics. And um, I get a little emotional about this. The, uh, when I saw those signs at Yale New Haven Hospital, for example, that said, heroes work here, mm -hmm. that was an amazing recognition of what it meant to be doing that kind of work day in and day out during this pandemic, particularly in those early months when we didn't, I mean, we, we, we didn't know it was gonna kill everybody who it touched. It was certainly killing people, people we knew. And so, uh, you know, that heroes welcome, uh, heroes work here signs made, just made me think, how can we make sure that our children, that um, uh, our society, recognize what this work is like day in and day out. Because if we do that, not only will it be more attractive uh, to kids to go into, but, it will, but burnout will, will be lowered. Right? People, um, there's lots of things that cause burnout, and, and sometimes it's some very bread and butter things, but sometimes it's just, I wish people knew what it is like to walk on my shoes. And uh, people should know what it was like to be a nurse in the early days of the pandemic. Yes. Um, it was to be a hero. Yet no nurse thought of themselves as a hero. They just thought they were going to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very impressive. And we know that the number of lost lives among nurses was the, the highest among all the uh, frontline you know, providers uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and um, despite your excitement, President Salovey, about the, 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 the elimination of, of um, uh, you know, hierarchical uh, 
uh, uh, you know, structure in the, the, the healthcare services that nurses nowadays really, you know, can speak up and uh, 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 if they see malpractice or whatever that is not working in, in the healthcare um, delivery by, by physicians. Uh, but we know that we are, we have still a long way to go. Uh, and um, um, so I, I, I wonder your thoughts about the, the, the still, you know, disparities of, of uh, uh, power, pay, you know, especially in other countries. I think that we have, um, we have gone a long way uh, in the United States, but uh, generally, globally, nurses are uh, usually the lowest paid, you know, healthcare professionals. Um, and also, you know, even in the United States, um, not being able to uh, practice to the full scope of, of nurses' capability. This is a huge, even economi economic waste of, of resources. So what are your thoughts about how we can really, um, you know, change um, the, the, the public, you know, image of, of what nurses do and why we need to really uh, empower nurses um, to... Uh, to practice to uh, the, the, the highest scope of, of their capabilities and get paid for it uh, appropriately. Well, I am pleased to see that this is changing. And uh, I'm not an economist or uh, sociologist who can really answer that question. But I will say um, no movement for change has ever happened, I think, without allies. Mm -hmm. And I think the allies are going to have to be other healthcare providers. And in particular, the ally in recognizing that nurses who can practice to their full capability mm -hmm. uh, are the, the ally that's going to have to recognize that, the potential ally who, has, who is going to have to recognize that to allow it to happen is organized medicine. And um, it's not a pretty picture historically. <laughs> and and I, you know, I don't want to pick on anybody or any profession. <laughs> My mother were alive, she still would want me to be a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, uh, we can, and there's plenty of, of, of physicians with a public health orientation, with a collaborative orientation who are very much champions uh, of nursing, uh, but we need more of them to be. And we need the formal organizations that represent uh, uh, physicians to be. Because I, I think both of you have said in your remarks, this is part of the solution. Nurses are gonna be part of the solution. That's true, by the way, in, my, in, in, in the mental health field uh, as well, in the field of psychology and psychiatry as well. Thank you very much. I think that now we have a few minutes for uh, questions from the audience, and uh, could you please, in order for you to be heard up, uh, by everyone, uh, wait for the microphone to uh, be delivered to you? Yeah, I have when... to find the microphone. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's the one on the podium. Oh, under here. Yeah. Thank you. This has been incredible journey for all of us. Um, I love the notion of primary health care prim disease, you know, primary health care disease prevention. And I think that in just looking, it's not just about promoting health within individuals or communities that's necessary, but structural changes that need to happen. And, you know, the concept of political you know, constraints that are affecting people's lives, as well as environmental and social um, things that are determining how many of the marginalized communities are subsisting, if you will, that we need to incorporate those concepts into the work that we do in just promoting health in individual and communities. And that we have to partner with all of those elements to be able to do that. And Kathy, Gillis, <laughs> Yes, we were primary care policy fellows together mm. back in the 90s. And that's one of the things I think is so critical for us to, 
to really start to work on as well. And thank you for this incredible presentation. I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh. I'm going to switch sides for Hi. <clears throat> uh, Richard Jennings, class of 79, midwifery. Uh, a little bit off topic, but what do you, do you, have you considered the role of guaranteed annual income as a way to address poverty in, in the United States? Uh, I, I, I can take uh, the foundation. Uh, it, the foundation actually has done a lot of work on different forms of uh, population level interventions that can address poverty, child poverty, and health improvements. And one of the shocking things we learned years ago was actually the most effective uh, health care access program in recent American social policy history was the earned income tax credit. The most, uh, which for those of you know, you know, is, is a basically a cash transfer uh, to, to certain working families. The most effective by far poverty program in the United States in any recent memory is the refundable child tax credit. Mm -hmm. And our foundation actually supported, uh, we had this strategy back in 2018 to support uh, advocating for those two interventions in red states and blue states. And so even certain states that didn't have income tax could still have a refundable child tax credit or earned income tax credit. And then when COVID hit, we actually brought all those local state grantees together to Washington uh, and had them meet with uh, decision makers in Congress and in the White House. And of course, the part of the COVID response was the largest social policy experiment in recent American decades, which was vastly expanding those two efforts as part of uh, providing some form of basic guaranteed income. And it was wildly effective. Child poverty got cut in half. The minute that went away, child poverty doubled. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just shocking how pinpoint accurate that was. And there are a consortia of, of foundations that studied all the impacts and found people don't waste the money. People don't use it for things that are not considered high value. It's mostly health care, child care, uh, support so families can be back in the, in the labor force, and nutrition. For, for children, and, uh, and so Eileen and her team work every day to try to build a more robust political environment that can look at the data and make rational decisions. We're not quite there yet as a country, uh, but it, it is, uh, and that's not specific answer on basic income, but those are, those are the biggest experiments we have with any sort of direct cash transfer that effectively operates as such. Hi, good afternoon. Back to the wellness. I think it was the second question about wellness. In the same manner, how do we provide incentives? Because everyone in this room and many of us know that wellness may be the answer, but if the finances, if we're in such a model of disease and symptom treatment, and that's where the money is for providers and people coming out of medical school who also have huge debt, and this is where they're going to make their money, and politically, pharmaceuticals. What are your thoughts about systemically? It's so easy to say wellness, and I've read the data too about preventable diseases, but what are some real steps that could be taken to shift the structure in this country? Well, speaking as someone who has no particular expertise on this other than um, a, a little bit about behavior change uh, in, at the individual level, uh, you know, w w it, it, providing incentives for individuals to make lifestyle changes that are probably built into their health care coverage uh, uh, would, would be one, one level at which to start. But you know, when we've tried that, for example, uh, I don't know how many of you are Yale Health members, but I get my health care from Yale Health. When we've tried that, where you get, you know, your premiums are lower, or you don't have to pay a copay, whatever, 
when you agree to a set of wellness uh, uh, interventions, um, it's hard to get people to agree. They, they resent the threat to their, what they believe is their autonomy and their freedom. And I think we have to work on that, uh, on that problem. And, you know, individual level incentives are good, but maybe we should try some group and societal level uh, incentives uh, uh, to try to encourage people to, to want to engage in, in those behaviors. You know, I could add two, two interesting experiments that I think offer a path forward. And this can be an area where we learn from other countries. But about 20 years ago, in Mexico, they had a program called Progresa. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. But they offered conditional cash transfers, as uh, President Salovey just said, to you know, incentivize certain behaviors. And they're not dramatically large cash transfers, but they uh, encourage uh, you know, a certain number of prenatal visits and postnatal visits and uh, other kinds of preventative-oriented interventions. And they were extraordinarily effective. Just, it was a behavioral economics reality that they were extremely effective. And, and some of those efforts got scaled around the world, Bangladesh, Kenya. And, and we, saw so, uh, we saw such significant results that we even brought some of those to Baltimore and Detroit and places in the US where they've also been effective. So, uh, so I think there's evidence for that basic approach. The other effort we just started is a major partnership with the American Heart Association called Food is Medicine. And in that context, insurers have been supporting experiments to identify whether dietary interventions can in fact reduce hemoglobin A1C levels in pre-diabetic and diabetic populations. And it's been so effective that we're scaling, scaling that up and doing a, a big national study to explore that as a basic approach to reducing the financial pressure, we spend $300 billion a year on <coughs> diabetes care in the United States, uh, nearly all of which is preventable. Uh, and it's basically a dietary disease, as you yeah. know. So, you know, but it is unfortunate that uh, for all of these types of things, you're up against some reality. <laughs> and, and the reality we're up against is we spend trillions of dollars every year in a very treatment intervention oriented after the fact medical system that proved to be extremely ineffective during the COVID pandemic in protecting Americans' lives. Yeah, I've, I've, there's so many n little demonstration experiments that, that we, we can learn from. Uh, right here in New Haven, uh, uh, there was a, a, a program to encourage community gardening, uh, and it teamed up with a, a program to encourage healthy eating so that the community, when you went to your community garden, learned how to grow in an urban setting, uh, often a very urban setting, uh, when you learned how to grow uh, things that you could eat, you then also learned how to cook them in the healthiest way, uh, and what have you. So that, 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 those are very small little interventions, very local, but, but, um, but that's maybe a good place uh, uh, for it to begin. I'm also reading right now, uh, many of you know our professor Tim Snyder, uh, Tim is uh, the uh, world's expert, really, on the history of um, Eastern Europe, the Baltic region, and now Russia and Ukraine. And many of you have seen him on the news, and his course on the history of Ukraine is, is um, online for anybody to take and is very, very good. I, I, people tell me that they um, appreciate it uh, uh, all the time. But uh, Tim wrote a little book a couple of years ago uh, I think it's called Our Malady, and it comes out of his experience of being a patient with a life-threatening disease or life-threatening condition, uh, uh, but, but being, uh, that's how it starts, and these were his diaries. But then he reflects on how care was delivered to him all over the world because he travels the world, he and his family. And uh, the example I just happened to read in the last couple of days was, I think it was... It was either the Netherlands or Austria, I can't remember now, where you get a little, when, when, you're, when you get your prenatal care, you get a little passport, thing that looks like a passport. And every time you, um, uh, you get, uh, you do a, a prenatal visit, it gets a stamp in the box for that visit. After you have a baby, uh, you get stamps for, the, for well baby visits uh, and the like. And as you accumulate these stamps, 
other health care needs that you might have are, deep, are more deeply discounted. Yeah. Right? And all you have to do is show your passport with all these stamps <laughs> in them. So it doesn't require great uh, technological intervention. But you show your passport. If they're stamped, when you need something done in the healthcare system, it's less expensive for you. Right? It was the simplest kind of intervention. And apparently everybody does it because it is simple. So there you have it. You're doing wellness prevention, and it's getting you something in addition to a longer, healthier life uh, um, fairly immediately. I, I would like to add to, uh, you know, in addition to individual incentives that, that um, uh, you both alluded to, I think that the systemic changes and also what Dr. Shah uh, suggested about really learning from the, the other countries that have a much uh, more focus on prevention and promotion uh, that has shown how they can reduce, uh, they have reduced their, you know, healthcare services costs and uh, the health outcomes of, are much, much better. Uh, so I think that we, we need to also focus more on policy changes, on, you know, political determinants of, of health. We focus a lot on social determinants of health, uh, but I think that what we miss is that, uh, you know, the, the root cause of a lot of, you know, uh, poor outcomes in this country goes back to the political determinants of, of health and that, how the decisions that are made uh, really, uh, you know, um, prevents healthcare providers and healthcare system to, uh, to um, you know, care more about the, the, the health outcomes of, of all the people. And uh, so, thank you. Yeah. Um, I want to thank all of you for uh, a really inspirational, your talks and your comments about past and future. And to follow up, uh, Dr. Mame, in terms of uh, in the passport issue, uh, when I was doing research in the UK, all women in the UK carry their prenatal record themselves for the entire pregnancy. Mm. And uh, no backup. You know, pre, it was this pre-electronic record, but no backup. And I remember asking, um, I was, I, um, as an ethnographer, I said, well, don't they ever lose it? And they said, of course not. <laughs> we lose it much more than they do. And then they said, why would she lose it? That's her baby. That's her future. And so that inevitable trust in the people that we're caring for is so incredibly important. Yeah. But that's not my question. <laughs> <laughs> my question is, as has been said, we spend so much money on health care, and yet we have so our primary providers uh, on the front lines are limited. We don't have enough. And, and we certainly don't have enough midwives. Um, and it's not just having more spaces in schools. Um, we can't, we turn away students because we don't have enough clinical sites. And one of the reasons we don't have enough clinical sites is there's not an investment in this country in graduate nursing education. Mm -hmm. It's a huge investment in medical education. Mm -hmm. So I'd ask you to say, what, what could we do to upend at that? Because I think it is about being able to help people have access to the marvelous education in so many schools, and especially at Yale. Well, I don't know the answer, but I'd say this. <laughs> I, if there was ever uh, a moment in recent history where the basic importance of nursing, primary care, massively scaling up diagnostic capacity in this country, uh, and democratizing access to basic health interventions was seen and felt by everyone. It was the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I don't actually know. I'm sure there's expertise in this room. But, but it feels like coming out of COVID, if we really look at why did America have the most excess mortality against modeled predictions? The answer was America has the least investment on a relative basis in good primary care. We don't value it as much as we should. We don't 
pay people as much as we should in that space. We don't build infrastructure as much. We don't even have enough testing capacity that reaches every community. Uh, and, and that, on a relative basis, is not that expensive to fix relative to you know, the trillions of dollars that we spend on, on other parts of the healthcare system. So this feels like our moment you know, to make that case. Okay. Hi, I'm Laron Nelson. I am the Associate Dean of Global Affairs and Planetary Health. First, I want to welcome and honor uh, Dean Imami for accepting to lead our school as we enter into the next uh, 100 years. Thank you. I also want to thank President Salovey and Dr. Shaw for being here to celebrate the centennial with us and for offering your thoughts on the future of nursing at Yale. My question is for you, Dr. Shah. I appreciated uh, reading your commentary that you published last summer online, which talked about the Rockefeller Foundation's interest in addressing the human toll of the climate crisis. As you've already heard, it's something that we're trying to prepare nurses, uh, nurse midwives, nurse practitioners, scientists, and leaders to contribute to that response as well. One of the things that we also think a lot about here uh, as it relates to the frequency of extreme weather events, goes beyond the tragic death tolls, yeah. but really to the scale of the post-traumatic stress effects that will occur in a global mental health, in the context of a global mental health infrastructure that is brittle, maybe to say the, the least, in many low and middle income countries. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that uh, the need to have Community-wide wellness is going to be key to any real sustainable recovery, whether it's social, political, or economic, in communities across the planet. What I'd uh, like to know if you could offer us any thoughts from the foundation about the role of promoting global mental wellness as a strategy for human adaptation in the context of this current climate crisis. Yeah, what a great, great question, as would be expected from Yale. Uh, <laughs> as you know, uh, I mean, mental health is the, is the fastest growing uh, source of morbidity, by the, according to the WHO, on a planetary basis. And if you look specifically at climate and the estimates, you know, you have the number of hungry communities going from about 700 million people to 1.4 billion people. You have 200 million climate migrants that's a lot of disruption in, in conflict, in political strife, and in human um, well-being. So I think, in general, mental health has to be a much bigger part of the assessment and the response kit uh, for nations that are trying to prepare for what their public health infrastructure looks like in the future. Unfortunately, right now, most of the countries that are most acutely hit are going through effectively a debt crisis. Uh, what happened during COVID was we poured 30 plus percent of GDP effectively in monetary and fiscal stimulus into our economy and it created a floor. They didn't, couldn't do that in 81 countries that house most of the world's most vulnerable people. And, uh, and as a result, right now, if you go to Kenya, 62% of their public budget is paying off interest. Ghana, I think it's 74%. Um, and that's true in 40 plus countries. And so at a time when they should be investing in what you're describing and planning for the future, they're actually cutting back on health services, which is why these numbers are getting worse instead of better uh, on, on basic things like maternal mortality, child mortality, and infectious disease prevalence. So uh, there's a big financing problem. And it's great to hear that you have enough of a culture of interdisciplinary problem solving that you can you know, bring your expertise from here together with policy teams that work on those issues. Um, but it clearly has to be a very, very big part of, of planning. Proper planning for public health in the future has to be redefined in a much, much broader way. Yeah. That's, that's global and local. Yes. So if you, if you live in New Haven like, yeah. like I do, you know, a big part of the city's budget is servicing debt yeah. and um, uh, making up for underfunded pensions, yeah. pension programs. And it's only after you 
pay for those, that you, that you begin those. to think about, you know, what could we do to promote the wellness of our, wow. uh, of our population? Unfortunately, we have time for only one more question. Um, so I think I saw somebody over here. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, careful, careful. Carol McKenzie, class of 73, maternal newborn and nurse midwifery. Um, I live in rural East Texas, a somewhat unenlightened political state, <laughs> with horrible maternal newborn outcomes. And I guess my question is, and also advanced nurse practitioners uh, do not have full authority. Mm -hmm. So if you look at all of those issues, how do you navigate the incredibly horrible political landscape? <laughs> Without causing a political brouhaha here. <laughs> but... <laughs> Well, let, let, let me try. Uh, <laughs> let, let me try, but I'll ask others to help. I, yeah. Well, th there is, I, th I actually think there are potential solutions on both sides of the political aisle. So, for example, uh, we, and we try and do support uh, policy analysis and advocacy and uh, innovation on both sides of the political aisle. But the, there ought to be a movement to deregulate the medical certification rule structure so that labor can be rewarded for the value it can generate, right, at every level. And that's a, that's a pretty, if that from first principles, that's a fairly conservative argument, and we found some very conservative Republican partners would advocate for that uh, with us, uh, alongside some more progressive communities that want to eliminate health disparities and, and have a different way of coming at the same problem. And so, you know, I mentioned what I mentioned about the earned income tax credit. That was actually created by Richard Nixon in a conservative policy context as the first negative income tax in the United States. And so, shockingly, there are areas where, where you can make progress, but they do seem to be dwarfed by the noise, and, and the noise is only going to get more noisy over the course of the next year. But, but the underlying point you're making is until everyone can be freed to use their skills to help their communities be well, and be rewarded for that, and not be constrained by rules that are effectively guild structure, political fighting. Um, you know, we're not going to have the workforce we need unleashed the way we need to to do it. And frankly, I personally think that the application of AI and other forms of technology will put even more pressure on that system, because yeah. you'll find people who believe they. Uh, uniquely own some grand expertise, uh, will find that, that that becomes less and less possible when your phone can do what you used to do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very, yeah. very sad. You know, I think a lot of this is, uh, you talked about Texas, a lot of this is due to the incredible political polarization that we see in our country right now. Some of the most important um, legislative approaches to um, health care uh, delivery, broadly speaking, were bipartisan efforts. I think, who in the Senate sponsored the Family Leave Act? Who were the two main co-sponsors of the, fam the original Family Leave Act. Does anybody remember? Ted Kennedy, that's one. Who is the other one? Huh? Orrin Hatch. Okay, right? So you had one of the most liberal members of the Senate, one of the most conservative members of the Senate. Why do they come together and do that? First of all, they were friends. They actually could have a civil conversation with each other. Second of all, they saw in Family Leave Act Kennedy probably saw uh, different things that produced the same ends or were produced by the same end. Kennedy sees a safety net program guaranteeing jobs. 
Hatch sees family-friendly legislation guaranteeing parent is going to be home at least in those early uh, months or weeks of a child's uh, life. And so they both can get behind this, this program. Why don't we see that today? There's a lot of reasons why we don't see that today. Two of them are gerrymandered political districts that make everybody worried that they're going to be challenged by somebody who's more extreme in their, in their uh, district uh, than they are, because that's who votes in primaries. And so they run to the extremes, uh, reject overtures by the other party because it looks weak and because they worry about their electability. And maybe the way in which media is polarized and every, every issue gets a, uh, has a uh, uh, you're either for us or against us kind of quality to the analysis uh, that we hear. Maybe that will change. I think we as members of the public have to kind of demand that kind of change. But um, I think we'll see more of the kind of legislation that has led to uh, programs that um, uh, of, of the kind we would all like to like in the health area if both parties could get behind them, because there is something for both parties in most of them. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would like to add that I, I think that uh, although the, the, the divisive of the you know, political um, the climate right now in this country, we, we shouldn't underestimate the power of community organization and advocacy. I think that a lot of changes, transformational changes that have happened throughout the history of the United States and also other countries, uh, if you look back, it, they are resulted of the community engagement and community organization. Um, and that, uh, I would like to look at our, our students here, because I think that nurses could play an important role. Part of our job as a nurse is advocacy. And then we need to really learn more to be engaged and add, to really be the voice of, of people who are not having the voice. And that could also impact the, the change in the, the political climate of this country. So that is something that I would like to see more uh, in our nursing profession. And our next generation of nurses will definitely do that for us. For sure. First of all, I would like to thank our special guests for a very wide-ranging, rich conversation. And thank you very much, the audience, for our, your uh, thought-provoking questions uh, and your engagement. Thank you very much. I think that we all learned a lot, and we are all inspired after this very rich conversation. Uh, so at this point of time, I would like to ask President Soloway to join me to the podium because um, I, I think that we have an announcement here. Okay. And um, I think you're going to make it and I'm going to clap. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, this is the best part of, uh, um, of, of uh, this event and also for me just joining and the Yale School of Nursing and have this privilege and honor to make this announcement. Nothing could be better as a uh, start for my deanship here. Uh, so uh, we would like to uh, make the announcement about uh, just recently an anonymous donor has recently finalized a very, very generous gift to Yale School of Nursing uh, in honor of our centennial. And uh, the gift will directly impact the students. We talked about, uh, you know, the debt and the cost of the education. And those type of, of uh, gifts are so amazing and so, so transformative for us to be able to not only attract the, the, the highly qualified uh, 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 nursing students, but also really diversify our, our, our programs. Um, so... And this gift will be an endowment um, to um, provide six full-ride scholarship every year, starting from this year. So it's nothing, it, no promise for, for future, um, but right now we can invent it, uh, use it. And this is the largest single donation we have received in the Yale School of Nursing. And the total gift is... $11.1 million. So 
So, of course, I'm very happy and uh, very excited about this wonderful opportunity. But I would like to thank everyone else beside me because I was not a part of, of this coming through. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much. It was definitely a teamwork of, of many years in making and a lot of people have been involved uh, uh, and um, so wonderful, wonderful opportunity for our school, wonderful opportunity for our students. So thank you very much. Mention the matching. Yeah. Oh, yes. Would you like oh, to so mention the matching? Right. Yeah. Um, so, I, so I read, I was looking at uh, the Dean's script and it says, and now President Sullivan would like to share some additional good news. And I'm thinking to myself, I wonder what that is. And I thought, it would be yeah. the news about matching. Yeah. So yes. as you know, uh, oh. the provost and I, uh, and uh, Scott Strobel, our provost, is here with us today, uh, pledged that we would use university funds uh, to match uh, the uh, first $50 million raised by this school uh, in the For Humanity campaign. So that 11.1, is it 11.1 yes. million dollars? I have to get the math exactly yes. right. That 11.1 .1 million dollars becomes 22.2 .2 million dollars uh, for the school. This is amazing, it's wonderful. Great, and we hope it inspires others. And I'm talking to our friends watching through the power yes, yes, of yes, Zoom, yes. of uh, YouTube right now. Yes, yeah. and, and when I heard about this news, I just felt, don't feel any pressure. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> how can I, uh, you know, match that in my, you know, this, we have until 2026, I think, to end the campaign, That's and right. hopefully we are going to, this major gift will inspire a lot of our, our friends and, and donors. It, it, it sure will. And uh, all joking aside, we couldn't be more grateful uh, to, to our anonymous donor for this yes. uh, incredible act. And uh, these are dollars that will go very far in the School of Nursing and will help with that debt issue that we were talking about uh, earlier today. So thank you very much. And thank you to anyone who is able to contribute we recognize not always at that level, <laughs> but in any way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Congratulations. So I would like to close uh, our celebration today with a round of applause to for Centennial Committee. Please join me to uh, thank them for their. The Centennial Committee represents a wide range of volunteers to really help and work very hard tirelessly in 18 months to planning and organizing all the events, the celebrations and everything that is going to happen throughout the, this year. And uh, some of uh, those amazing volunteers uh, are today with us in this room. So I would like to ask you to stand up to be recognized if you are here, as I, I'm reading your name. Janine Baden. Helen Burst. Elizabeth Doyle. Oh my goodness. Melissa uh, Gallinado. Mattia <laughs> Black Greeter. Holly <laughs> Powell Kennedy. <laughs> Michelle Koss. Mel Kostorko, Nancy Cross, Gail McCollett, Erin Morelli, Caroline Piselli, Heather Reynolds, Thomas, 
and Dave is the law hub. <laughs> I also would like to thank Michelle Morgan and Tipsy Pix crew for their uh, videography services here today, and HB Live for their broadcast support, and our event manager, M Michelle Koss again, for making all the behind the scene magics. <laughs> I'm also grateful to Hilary Dooley, Julia Pafford, Mike Reagan, and tailored um, testimony on our um, Office of Development and Alumni Relations for all the contributions that made it to today's very successful day for us. Yeah. And last but not least, I would like to thank both our, our special guests. Thank you very much for carving out of your very, very busy time to come here and have this wonderful discussion. This is a great uh, initiation of our year-long uh, celebration. So Dr. Shah, if you join me now here so that I could present with you a small oh. token of uh, here. Yeah. Our, our appreciation for, for your time oh, here. My. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, exactly. Wow. <laughs> That's nice. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.